If you have your Bibles, turn them to the book of Hosea, chapter number 3. So Hosea, chapter number 3. If you've been a while since you've been in Hosea, take go to uh, Psalms and turn right. and Go past Isaiah and Jeremiah. And when you get to Daniel, you're one book away. And then you'll find the book of Hosea. We are uh, in a series uh, on the love of God or the, the things of God. Really, I got this outline from a tombstone. It was this, this person died and how they were trying to define this person. They said five things about him. And they said the first one I talked about last week, we need to know God. I mean, we need to know who he is. And then we need to love God. So um, that's what I'm going to be talking about today is to love God. Jesus was asked the question, um, what the greatest commandment was, Matthew 22 and Mark 12. And his reply to them was the Shema, which basically is you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That was Deuteronomy chapter 6. He added a caveat from uh, Leviticus 17 that we are also to love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves. I think if you have God's love, you're going to love in that way. You're going to love God in that way. You're going to love everybody in that way. And that's the thing that is about it. But man's love is different from God's love. Man's love, we love the things that <clears throat> bring us pleasure. We love those things that we enjoy. So if we, in, we see something and we enjoy it, well, we love it. But the thing about us is, is if, we, if it no longer brings us pleasure, then we no longer love it. It's very easy for us just to cast things, things, things aside. But, but God loves differently than that. God's love um, is when he looks at something, he sees it in truth, but yet he still values it. He cherishes it. There's something there that just draws himself to it, and it's not the worth like man looks at it. Man just says, as long as I enjoy it, it's good. God just loves it anyway. And because he loves it and finds value in it, because he cherishes it, here's an amazing thing. The God of the universe serves it. He puts himself under it. Now think about that. The one that is above all will still lower himself under the one that he values and that he cherishes. And he tells us that we're to love in the same way. We're to love God in that way, but we're to love others in that way. Yet, <clears throat> I'm going to say this right here at the beginning. I hope this is the invitation that you're going to get right off the bat. I want you to think about it for the next 30 minutes. The roadblock to revival in our life and in our church is because we as individuals, we don't know God the way we should. We're not really desiring to get to know God. We've got as enough, enough as God as we want, and we're okay with that. And We also don't love God the way he wants to be loved. We've got an understanding of him. And we love him in our way. As long as God brings us pleasure, as long as God brings us enjoyment, as long as God does things that we understand and we agree with, then okay, we'll love God. But don't ever ask me to do anything that makes me uncomfortable. Don't ever ask me anything to do anything that, that's beyond uh, uh, this type of service that you do. I'm good, but I want it to be about me. But God says, you're never going to really know what God is until you start loving him and loving others in this unselfish, true, valued way. We need to learn to love God. And I think that's what the book of Hosea tries to teach us. So if you have your Bible, hopefully by now you've found Hosea chapter number 3. And if you would, would you stand with me in honor of reading God's Word? <clears throat> Hosea chapter number 3. Beginning in verse 1. Then the Lord said to me, go again. Love a woman who is loved by a lover. 
and is committing adultery. Just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love the raisin cakes of the pagans. Literally, that the raisin cakes there was, was, was something that they would use in the service, a, a sacrifice, to the pagan god of the Canaanites called Baal. So he says, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel, who the children of Israel look to love other gods and love the raisin cakes of the pagans. So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver, one and a half homers of barley. <clears throat> and I said to her, you shall stay with me many days. <clears throat> you shall not play the harlot. <coughs> <clears throat> nor shall you have a man, so too will I be towards you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Now, Father, we are grateful that you love us. We are grateful that in the amazing God that you are, you're all powerful so you can do all things. You're all wise so you know that which is best. And you're most loving, all loving, completely loving. And yet you point that towards us. And I don't know why you love us when we act the way that we do, but you love us with an everlasting love, with an eternal love, with a love that blesses, with a love that honors. You cherish us, oh God. So Lord, in the next 30 minutes, by the power of the Holy Spirit, would you just Speak to us plainly and personally and from your heart to us. And Father, teach us what love looks like. Help us to understand what it feels like. And Lord, that you have a love that is so amazing, so endless. So Lord, show us your love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you be seated? Hosea was a prophet in the country Israel at the same time that uh, Amos was a prophet to Israel. And they were contemporaries to Isaiah and Micah as they were a prophet in the southern kingdom of Judah. And God wanted to uh, use this called prophet as a picture, as an example of himself to his people, Israel, and to Judah. You see, I think we learn better by not just hearing it, but seeing it. I think we understand better when we can have it drawn out. Our minds just can capture it better. So what he decided to do was to take his prophet that he loved, Hosea, and let his life be a life lesson. Let it be a picture of, of his love for his people of Israel. So he says to him, "Take a go and look in chapter 1. Thank you, my brother. <clears throat> in verse number 2, when the Lord began to speak by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea. So understand right off the bat, he's going to speak through Hosea. So in speaking through Hosea, he spoke to Hosea. Hear the words. Go, take yourself a wife, a wife of harlotry, and children of harlotry. And the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. Go, take yourself a wife of harlotry. Single man, loves God, wants to honor God, wants to obey God, wants to hear. And God says, I got a work I want to do in your life. This is what I want you to do. Go find your wife. All right then. Go find a wife of harlotry. I beg your pardon? Yeah, go find a prostitute and make it yours. Now, can I just pause here for a moment? That's not the normal thing you hear from God. But sometimes God speaks in a way that you may be unfamiliar with, but don't, 
doubt him for a second, that still may be God. And God's words are always blessed words. And God's words are always beneficial words. And I, I learned as a young preacher right off the bat, I don't want to be a Jonah. Amen? I mean, Jonah was obedient, but it took God a little bit of teaching him to be obedient. Wouldn't it be better if we just learned right off the bat? Well, he loved God enough to trust him even when he didn't understand him, so he went out to the red light district. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Where all the prostitutes hung out. If you were looking for someone like this, that's where you would go to find one. And he begins to look, but his heart is seeking obedience unto God. And he finds one whose name is Gomer. I'm not going to make any jokes other than he, he, it had to be a God calling on your life to marry a woman by the name of Gomer. Can I get an amen? That's the only word I'm going to say on that, and we'll just go a little further. But he finds her, and he begins to talk with her, and begins to get to know her. And he, he hears the tuning fork go off in his heart, like so many of us when we begin to fall in love. And he begins to show her affection and show her kindness. And he listens. And, and he is accepting of her. And something begins to develop within him, a deep affection toward her. And he begins to be generous to her and giving to her. And he begins to be friendly and kind and helpful. And he sees something in her. And then one day, under the leadership of God, he says, will you? And she said, yes, I will. And they begin to be husband and wife. She left the life behind. Most likely, we do not know how she had become a prostitute. In that day, a woman could not own a business. So for her to uh, have to have any way of providing for herself, she was either going to, someone was going to have to take care of her, or she would have to possibly be like this, a prostitute. And it could have been that she just became homeless and it was thrust upon her. But most likely in her particular life, she was probably married to someone who just wrote her off and just gave her a certificate of divorce. And now she finds herself out there with no way to provide for herself and she becomes a prostitute to do such. And if you do something for a certain period of time, it becomes a part of who you are. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And it'll, it becomes a cloud that follows you until the cloud sets over your spirit and it changes you. And she probably really didn't have any hope and probably thought, oh my goodness, who is this person who's taking personal time with me, who wants to talk with me, who's very kind and giving and accepting and pursuing of me. I don't feel worthy of this, but, but now she leaves the lifestyle behind and she goes and joins herself to this person by the name of Hosea, a God-man. And they begin to live a life together. And they begin to have children. Look what it says in chapter 1, verse number 3. So we went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblium, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, call his name Jezreel. They had a son. God told him what to name him. Jezreel, which means God scatters. Don't you know there were some looks when they went to synagogue to name the child? What are you going to name your boy, your firstborn? Jezreel. Jezreel, God scatters? Yes, that's what we're going to name him. You see, because, like I said, God was going to use Hosea as a, a picture example for the children of Israel. It says there in verse number four, Call his name Jezreel, for in a little while I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu, bringing in to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. You see, that's the story of 2 Kings 10. 
God says, I'll scatter you, Israel, and he did, because of their sin. Verse number six, she conceived again, bore a daughter this time. God said to him, call her name lo Ruhamah, which means lo, no, mercy. No, mercy. Why? For I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. Yet I will have mercy on the house of Judah, will save them by the Lord their God, <clears throat> will not save them by bow or by sword or battle, by horses or horsemen. I will allow Israel to be taken away by the Amorites, and I will not give them mercy. Verse 8, when she had weaned Lo uh, Ruhamah, she conceived and bore a son, third child. Now it's a boy again. Call his name Lo Am I. Am I? No, Lo. Not my people. Not my people. Why? For you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Could you imagine having these children, God doing a work in his life? And yet, somewhere in the line here, his wife, something began to happen to her. She began to long for something else. She took her husband's love for granted. She thought something else would make her happy. And she walked away from Hosea. She walked away from his love. And look what it says in chapter 2, verse 5. For their mother has played the harlot. She who conceived them has behaved shamelessly. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool, my linen, my oil, in my drink. I'll leave my family behind. I'll leave my children behind. And I'll go chase the love that I think that I deserve in another place. That's not the love of God. God's love is so much better. God's love is so wonderful. It's who He is. And it's what he does. I like how Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He says there, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not arrogant or rude. Listen to me now. Love does not insist on its own way. You know people who only want their own way? Love is not like that. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing. Love rejoices in the truth. I love this. Love bears all things, endures all things, believes all things, hopes all things. Those great words. Love never fails. Literally what he is saying is love, God's love, never ends. And yet, Gomer walked away. She walked away from the joy of a home and walked away into pain. God said there very plainly, verse 6, I will hedge up your way with thorns and wall her in so that she cannot find her paths. I'm not going to let her just leave me and, and find the, uh, the pleasures in these things. No. I'm not going to let this happen. God allows pain because pain's one of the gra greatest examples and tools of teaching us things. When you were a little kid and your parents said, don't touch that, it's hot, what did you do? You touched it. I did too. And it burned you. And they looked at you. And by the way, they didn't snatch you up. They let you do it, didn't they? 
because you needed to learn. And, and, and hearing them wasn't going to be enough. And you touched it, it burned you, and they said, I told you. Right? I wonder how many times God's told us, but we haven't listened. There's that stitch in our side, and we put it off because a lot of us men, we don't like to listen to those things because we're tough, you know. We got that big S on our chest. We're, we can leap tall buildings in a single bound. We're faster than a speeding bullet, all that. We, we're Superman. We don't have to. But that appendix will burst unless you listen to that pain. Y'all hear me? I mean, shouldn't we look at our situation and know what's it going to take, church? How much pain are we going to have to go through in life before we stop and pause and look to God and say, you didn't want it this way. She left, but God fenced her in with thorns. He said in verse 7, she will chase her lovers, but will not overtake them. Yes, she will seek them, but not find them. Then she will say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then it was better for me than now. For she did not know that I gave her grain and new wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold, which they had prepared for Baal. God says, therefore I will return and take away my grain in its time, my new wine in its season. I will take back my wool and my linen, given to cover her nakedness. I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lover's and no one shall deliver her from my hand. Not only was he using Hosea to teach Israel a lesson, he's also using Gomer. She walked back out into her harlotry, her prostitution. Galatians chapter 5, verse 7, Paul says it well. Y'all listen to me, church. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. You're not going to mock him. He's God. For whatsoever a man sows, that he will also reap. You sow it, but you'll reap it. You're going to chase those things. You know what you're going to find? Come on, church. There are things in our life that we follow after. There are things in our life that mean more to us than God. There are things that are in our life that are closer to us than God, that we cherish more than God. I mean, we like God as long as he brings us the pleasure and the enjoyment and all of that, but, but, but when we get tired of God, we'll walk away. I wonder how many people have walked away. I wonder how many people are on the church rolls but never go to church. I wonder how many people have a copy of God's holy word but they don't go searching for God there. I wonder how many people know the living water of prayer and of the spirit of God but don't take time there. Jeremiah said it well in Jeremiah chapter 2. Let me quote you what he said. Verse 13, Jeremiah 2, 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and have hewn themselves cisterns. They, they've cut out their own wells, broken cisterns that can hold no water. He said, look, I've come to you like a living fountain, a spring, a fresh, cool Water that will quench your thirst and, and satisfy. But for comfort, come on now, and for convenience, you, you cut out a well close to home. They would literally dig it out of limestone, call it a cistern, to catch the water when it rained where all they would have to do is not walk down to the fountain because that took effort. Just go out and Get a dipper of it. But have y'all ever been out when the water's sat stagnant a few days? Come on. And bugs get in it. Or some animal wants a drink too and crawls up in it and dies. Come on. How many of y'all like skunk water? 
I mean, a bird flies in to wet its beak and dies there, so you got to drink some dead bird. And it's broken. It leaks out. You think you've built it up, and you think this is what's going to satisfy you, but it just leaks out. And they would literally plaster the inside of those cisterns, but they continue to leak. He says in the 14th chapter, Jeremiah 14, verse 3, he says, Their nobles have sent their lads for water. They went to the cisterns and found no water. They returned with their vessels empty. They were ashamed and confounded and covered their heads. What else did they expect? Why would you give up the fresh spring water of the fountain of the Lord to chase after that which looks mighty appealing. And by the way, the world leads the way and the church is following the ways of the world. The church has set up the values for themselves like the values of, of, of the world. And instead of following God's paths, we're simply seeking out that which brings us enjoyment and pleasure and if, it, if it's hard for us, we'll walk away in a heartbeat. I don't know that I haven't done more preaching than you've already done listening. But I pray that you'll hear what God had to say. Look in chapter 3. He says in verse 1, go again. Go again. Lord, it was hard the first time when you told me to go find a wife of prostitution. You want me to go again? Come on now. Don't you know how I'm hurt? I wonder how Hosea felt when Gomer walked away. How would you feel if the one that you gave yourself to said, I no longer love you. I no longer want to be with you. I would rather be with strangers than with you. Embarrassed? I wonder what he told his kids when they came and said, where's mom? We want mom. She's no longer here. She left us. She went out and sought her way. I wonder how many times, come on, he had to console his kids as they cried at night. I guarantee you he was angry. He may have even gotten a little bitter. Probably said within himself, I could never forgive her for what she did to me. But God says, no, go again. God, that's too hard. Is it really? All you got to do is just agree. Go again. Look what he says. Love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery. That is in the present tense. She is committing adultery. But cherish her. Find value in her. And serve her. <laughs> because that's who God is. And we, the children of God, that's what we're to be. And yet we put limits on who we will love and how we will love. And it's got to be this way. God, if you expect me to join this, if you expect me to be a part of this, you've got to do it this way. I can't do that. You're asking too much of me, God. I can't do that. Go again. Praise God for an obedient prophet named Hosea. So look what it says in verse 2. So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver. And one and a half homers of barley. Gomer had found herself 
in prostitution, and she got to the place where she could not even provide for herself. And, and either she sold herself or was, her claim was taken, and now she is owned by another who treats her like a slave. And you know what he wanted, right? And he found his enjoyment in her until he didn't. And when she had no, uh, she brought him no enjoyment any longer, he said, I'll just sell you. And she was auctioned off on, on the downtown steps. And God says, go ahead, go again, buy her back. How embarrassed he was. And folks, the price wasn't high. It wasn't like he was being outbidded 15 shekels of silver. You don't need to know what the value of that is because that's a weight. So let me tell you the weight, and you could use it in today's terms. Six ounces of silver. Six ounces, that's all. One and a half homers of barley. Three bushels. Three baskets of barley. Is all the value of a person? I tell you, it costs God a whole lot more than that to love us. It cost him his most precious son. Who was willing to give up all the glories of heaven and come down here and face the ridicule of this earth. Willingly come. Willingly serve. Because he saw value in us. Look in verse 3. He buys her back for this small cost. Hosea said, and I said to her, you shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot, <laughs> nor shall you have a man. So too, come on now, will I be toward you. Honey, I made a covenant with you. You are mine and I am yours. We become one flesh. Now you left me and you went and joined yourself with another. But I just want you to know, you're my wife and I'm your husband. All that I have belongs to you. You forget that. You are mine. You are cherished. You are of value. And I will always do for you. It's my covenant joy. I believe Hosea is in the Old Testament what Jesus taught in Luke 15 in the New Testament, the story of the prodigal son, the son who had everything of his father, all that was his, but he took it. He said, no, 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 I want to do what I want. And he took his inheritance and left and squandered it and found himself living with the pigs, eating what the pigs ate. But he came to himself and said, the servants at my father's house have more than I do. I will go home to my father. And as he rehearsed that apology all the way home, his father was there looking for him. And when he was a long ways off, his father saw him and ran toward him. He pursued the prodigal. And with deep affection and kindness, he wrapped his arms of love around him. And he called to his servants and said, get the robe. My child is home. He belongs to me. Put the ring on his finger. He's not a slave. He is my child. Put sandals on his feet. He restored him. Praise God for a God who restores. How Hosea must have felt when he put clothes over her. Because you know when they were bidding her off that her nudeness was seen. She was nothing but an object. But not to him. He loved her. You're mine. You're mine. I think of what Hosea's reaction was. I think of what Gomer's reaction was. 
But also think of what God's reaction is when we so easily walk away. When we so easily chase other things. Instead of, instead of loving our Lord, our God, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. How does it make him feel when he gives us the living water and we want to drink foul water? When he gives us his son, his only begotten son, we choose the idols of this world. Church, listen, please, very intently for the next few moments. To have revival, folks, I've been praying for revival. I want God's way, not our way. I want the power of God, not the power of man. I want the joy of my salvation, not the staleness of this walk. There is joy in revival. There is pleasure in God restoring his people. I want the things of earth to grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. But I'm here to tell you, when we hear from God, oft times we don't yield to God. Because of that, we go back to seeking our own way again. But to have revival, we're going to have to learn how to love God. We're going to have to learn to love the way God loves. So let me, as a student of revival for all these years, let me tell you a few things I've learned. The hindrances to revival. Bitterness. Resentment, unforgiveness. I can make this statement very plainly. I would say everybody in this room has been hurt. Things happened to you that should not have happened. Things were said to you that should not have been said. Some of you have had people walk away. Some of you have felt half that small. You felt like you had no worth, you had no value at all, and you've been scarred, you've been hurt. And the natural thing to happen from that is a little touch of bitterness, a little bit of unforgiveness, a little bit of resentment, but that sin, come on now, and it never stays there. It always grows. Bitterness creates more bitterness. Unforgiveness creates more unforgiveness. Resentment becomes a way of life. I promise you we live in a world today that is so easy to see people and judge. We don't see them as value. We write them off in a heartbeat. I'm a pastor. I can promise you. I promise you. I have been written off more times than you'll ever know. But not by God. Never once. I have been loved. People have loved me. But I've also been discarded. Because I wasn't loved with the love of God. Have you been loved with the love of God? Isn't it good? I mean, doesn't it well up within you with satisfaction and joy and peace? All those fruits of the Spirit. I mean, there are times when I'm in church, I oftentimes sit upstairs because I know that I'm viewed and I don't sit down here because there's times I want to raise my hands to God and worship There's times I almost want to just have a holy fit because God has done so very much for me. If you want to judge me, you can. Get in line. 
But I tell you, revival will not come until resentment is gone. Bitterness is turned over to the Lord. Forgiveness, as you have been forgiven, so we must forgive. Clean slate. The blood of Jesus Christ frees us. Love is a choice. People say, I, I, I can forgive, but I can't forget. You won't forgive because you don't want to forget. You want them to pay. You've made up your mind that they're wrong, and you want to hold them to their hurt. When what we need to do is let go and let God. Do not let resentment and bitterness, and what someone did to hurt you, bring unforgiveness that keeps you from the fresh fountain of water that springs from Jesus Christ, that quenches your thirst eternally. It will keep you from revival, and hear this and hear this well, it's what keeps churches from having revival is when people in the church would rather hold to that unrepented of sin rather than getting things right with God and letting God bless.